That's the end of the commercials. You guys ready to jump into God's Word this morning? Yeah? They're like, thank goodness. We didn't know it was going to be that. But, uh, but I do want you to know that. So this morning, uh, I feel like the Lord wants me to, to convey something to you about being intentional about the way that you think. So thinking about how you think. This is important because, as you know, uh, sometimes our minds, our perceptions, our judgments, our assumptions can be way off. Anybody ever guilty of that? Anybody ever thought something was one way only to find out that, boy, was I wrong? That's a hard, that's a hard word to say even when I'm not even really admitting it, right? Just saying it in conversation. Oh, boy, I was wrong. That's not something we like to do. We like to be right. We like to be accurate, uh, and we don't like to be wrong, but let's be honest, a lot of times we just don't get it. I was talking to somebody this week, and um, they had had their feelings hurt by a comment that someone that we both knew had made, and, and I kind of reminded them, I said, well, look, the way you're thinking about that, you know them. You know, they don't say hurtful things like that. I don't think, maybe you misperceived exactly what was going on. And by me saying that, they were able to go, maybe, maybe, right? Like, sometimes we just get a little bit um, on edge. Uh, we take things the wrong way. We don't kind of, here's the thing, we don't give the other person a lot of benefit of the doubt. We just sort of, you know, we get wounded. We get, we get cut a little bit when people say things. That's because our assumptions and our thoughts. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to let our thoughts, our, you know, all those things. We don't want our perspectives, our assumptions. We don't want those things to just run rampant. And so I think Scripture addresses this to a degree, but in the context of this, uh, and and this would be the title if you need a title, it's don't make small things big things. Don't make the small things the big things, but we tend to do that, don't we? Uh, In in, in younger circles, we call this drama, right? You're taking something that's this big, you're making it like it is the center of the world, like, and you know what, I hate to say, I'm not even going to put that on our younger crowd, we're pretty good at that as, as we age too, aren't we? We take stuff, it's, it's literally the, the opposite of the saying. It's making, making, uh, making mountains out of molehills, right? Uh, something really is, is, is flat, it has nothing to it, but we make it into this monstrous hill to climb, this massive thing that we have to deal with. But a lot of that has to do really with what's going on inside of us and not so much the truth. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of show you a couple, two quick examples of, of people in Scripture who did this, just so you get a, a really plain idea of what we're talking about, all right? So would you pray with me? Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I thank you that it is life to us. God, it's true. It's the one thing we can count on. Timeless. Timeless. So, Father, I pray that you'll use it to nourish us, use it to help us grow, transform our minds and hearts by it. Holy Spirit, I pray you'll be the loudest teacher in the room. Be the voice we hear. Mass, you'll do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so in 1 Samuel, this is 1 Samuel 1, verses 12 through 14. It says, as she was praying to her Lord, Eli watched her. Eli is the priest. Uh, seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she'd been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded? Throw away your wine. Now, you, you look at that and you're like, what in the world is that talking about? Unless you know the story. Hannah was praying and I think her words were from a, uh, a standpoint of tremendous grief. She was heartbroken. She was barren. She couldn't have a child. She was begging the Lord uh, to, to help her overcome this problem. This is a, a situation where she had a big problem. But can you see how easily Eli misperceived what she was doing? She wasn't doing the ritual prayer reciting speaking out loud. She was doing this. He tells her, what, what do you, why do you have to show up here drunk? Right? And I kind of laughed because I'm like, what was going on with Eli that he was so aggravated someone was there praying? What, 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 why was he having such a bad day? They clear it up in the passages to follow. You can definitely read that. But I just want you to see that someone of the status of Eli was very quick to make a wrong assumption. What does that mean for you and I? It means that we better admit that we're able to do the very same thing. We have to be very careful to go into every situation quickly assuming that we understand and we have all the facts. Because the truth of the matter is, is that the truth is a little bit harder to find than just what's on the surface. 
And we oftentimes operate, it could just be that you got a bad night's sleep. It could be anything. And it causes you and I to make these assumptions like Eli did. What's wrong with you? Throw away your wine. She wasn't even drinking. But he thought she was. Here's another one in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 22. It says, but Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. He's getting on Jesus' case here. He said, you know, that he forbids it. Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. So Jesus was talking about the tough things that would happen to him. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. Why? Because you're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And Jesus said uh, to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. So in other words, he was saying to Peter very directly, look, you can be in opposition to God, even saying what sounds right, if you're seeing it from your perspective and not God's perspective. This is one of the reasons that God's word is so important. Because God's word, being consistent, being inspired, being accurate, shows us how God thinks about things. And so when I begin to filter my thoughts, to run my thoughts alongside Scripture, I can see just how in line with God's heart they are. How in line they are with the way God sees things, not the way I see things. And for Peter, he he catches a lot, a lot of heat for this particular scripture, by the way. Everybody just latches onto this and kind of makes a definition of Peter, but Peter's intentions were good. He was saying to his friend, to the one that he had recognized was the son of God, that this stuff can't happen to you, but Peter just didn't understand the plan. Peter didn't understand the goal long term. And you and I have to begin to realize that sometimes we may get out of line and God will bring us correction and we move on and it's okay. And so our perspectives, our judgments, all these things matter because we want to see things the way God sees things. And if we don't see things the way God sees things, then guess what? We can actually face mountains that aren't even mountains. We can actually face these insurmountable circumstances that that really don't need to be that way. We make really big things out of really small things when we don't see things the way God sees things. So things not only challenge us, but we don't even see it accurately to to approach it. Does that make sense? This has happened to me. Anybody else? No? You guys probably just have easy lives. Just kidding. All right, let's look. This is a very long passage. It would uh, terrify you to know that it takes up almost two pieces of paper. Uh. 1 Kings chapter 19 is a fairly recognized passage of Scripture. This is about the prophet Elijah, but I want to point some things out to you. And and I want you to see that someone, even of the status of an Elijah, can get into a place where he's not quite perceiving and seeing things the way that God wants him to. It says when Ahab got home, Ahab was the king, by the way. I I don't want to assume you know these things. He was the king. He told Jezebel, who was his wife, the queen, everything that Elijah had done. He had just had this big interaction with Ahab on a mountain where God, where he called down fire and fire burned up a sacrifice and he killed like 400 prophets uh, that day. And so Ahab goes and tells Jezebel that he killed all the prophets of Baal. Who is the, who is the, uh, the God who is not a God? How about that? The God they worshiped. So Jezebel sent this message message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me by this time tomorrow if, if I have not killed you just as you killed them. So here's the threat from the queen to Elijah. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that the Lord prayed that he might die. Think about what's happening here. I don't know about you, but if I have the kind of week that Elijah was having, I feel like I might not be as afraid as he is. I feel like that if I challenged the prophets of another God and I made an altar and they made an altar and they prayed, they shouted to their God. They cut themselves with stones. They did all these things. Nothing. 
Elijah prays to God. God sends fire down and consumes not only, uh, not only the sacrifice, the altar itself dries up all the water, everything gone. And then he turns around and kills 400 prophets. Then the queen says, I'm going to kill you. And he does what? I'm out. Right? Now, I'm just going to say, this is probably why you will never see the Lord honor my prayer to call down fire. <laughs> right? Because I'm going to be calling it on everything. Right? People at stoplights that don't go when it's green, everything, you know? So that's why, you know, I'm not responsible enough for that type of thing. But anyway, let's move on, right? It says, uh, uh, he prays that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Now, I know you and I have been there, right? I've had enough. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down and slept under uh, the broom tree, which... As he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, uh, and there beside his head was some bread baked and hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank, and then he laid down. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more, for the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. So he got up, he ate, he drank, and the food, uh, the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. The mountain of God. So, so here he is. He, he starts out, he just runs to a nearby town. The angel tells him, now you've got to eat and drink, strengthen yourself. You've got a 40-day, 40 40-night 40 journey to Mount Sinai. Uh, there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, now when, when God asks you questions like that, you have to know God already knows. It's a rhetorical question. I want you to think, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said this, he said, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty. The people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the, and after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, just so you know, if you're ever hearing God, you can look at this passages like this and see that when God asks you a question the second time, it's because you missed the answer the first time. Okay? And Elijah says, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people in Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down the altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came. Rerun, right? Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet, listen to this, yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal nor kissed him. So I want you to see in, in, in this account uh, just how um, someone can be anointed as even a prophet back then, being the one who communicates God's word to the people, they're able to do miraculous signs and wonders, able to call down fire, able to all kinds of things, right? You know about Elijah, you know that this was, this was a guy who wasn't unfamiliar with God, yet the circumstances of his life got him to such a place that he was like, I'm just tired. It's just me. Nobody else is doing this. Anybody ever been that way? And we ever had a little, little bit of an Elijah-style pity party and think that you're the only one trying to do the right thing anymore? I have. I'm not going to lie. 
Lord, it would be so much easier just to cheat like everybody else. Nobody? Okay, just me. Elijah says this twice. In the midst of, of a windstorm, an earthquake, a fire, a gentle voice that God was in, he still answers the question the same way. So he says, okay, look, you've got to go back the way you came. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to have you anoint this person. I'm going to have you anoint that person. This is the guy who's going to take your spot one day. Uh, I want you to walk back and meet all them. And yet, in the middle of that, I'm going to preserve 7,000 people who are like you. 7,000 people. And that's not a lot of people, but that's definitely not I'm the only one left. So I would say if you look at it from a, from a scaled thing, Elijah was only 6,999 people off in his assessment about how the state of the world was. That's pretty off, right? And we see where someone like Elijah could get to that point, and we, and, and we, we actually can sympathize with I can. Can sympathize with him. Now, I've not done the miracles by no means that Elijah had done. I don't walk uh, definitely in the same, uh, the same place he walked, but at the same time, Elijah was, while he was an amazing prophet, he was still human. He was still a man. He still had feelings. He still had to run all of his thoughts and perceptions through some kind of filter. And in seeing that he's made this mistake, it only reinforces to me that I'm very apt to make this same mistake. Because at the end of the day, the scriptures had pointed out, and I want to make sure I'm right because it was a little bit different between Ahab and Elijah, or Ahab and Jezebel, but basically dogs would end up eating them. There would be such dishonor in their end that this is how it was going to end. And Elijah knew that. He just couldn't see it. But it ended up being true. And so you and I need to understand that, that, that just because we think a thing is a certain way and we can only see it this way, please don't think that's the only way it is. Because you and I, again, we will tend to make small things big things, won't we? Anybody, um, <laughs> I'm even hesitant to say this. Has anyone been like me and just wanted to throw your chair at your TV anytime in the last couple of years? I'm serious. If my TV wasn't like 600 bucks, I'd throw my chair right through it, just for the sheer joy of it. Why? Because I'll tell you what, what you're being marketed in the form of news, and I don't care which news you watch, it's all the same. What you're being marketed is mountains out of molehills. Doesn't mean they don't talk about things that are important or significant or that matter. But they'll always blow it up to be bigger, worse, more terrifying, more urgent than it, than it might be. Okay? It, now, now, here's the challenge in that. It doesn't mean, it, like I said, it doesn't mean it's meaningless. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that as believers we shouldn't stand where we should stand and that we should definitely understand that we're in a different kind of time than we were a decade ago. But at the same time, don't let yourself be fooled into falling under the same type of, you know, when you hear the threat that they yell, don't run because it's Jezebel. Stop and think about it. Stop and think about where God is in this thing. What does the Lord say about times like these, situations like these, issues like these? All of this stuff, you have to run it through. How does God see this thing? And the safest thing to do is stand there. Find out where God is, stand there. Stay right there. Not more important than it's ever been, the same importance that it's always been. Just might feel a little more important now. All right? I'll send you to another story in the scripture. I hate to say story, an account, because it's accurate. It's not a story, not fairy tales. When David sees Goliath, do you think he was seeing Goliath right, or is everybody else seeing Goliath right? Think about when David came onto the scene. He was just bringing his brother's lunch, and he walks up and he sees Goliath. He begins to ask about him, and I'm not going to read you that whole account. 1 Samuel 17, 16 says this, For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. That's what they told him. Because David was like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine that dares, you know, challenge the 
armies of God. And he says, so, so he kind of sees this thing unrolling. If you don't know this, if you don't know how this went down, you have two opposing armies, and you, the one army, the Philistine army, has a champion named Goliath. He's a giant, uh, you know, over nine feet tall, massive in every way. He comes out, and for 40 days, he struts in front of me, he challenges them, send somebody out and fight me. If they can kill me, you know, th- that's it. But if not, and he basically taunts and he ridicules God and Israel. For 40 days and for 40 nights, a little boy named David, who is just a shepherd boy, literally a boy, comes on the scene and he starts asking questions. What's this guy doing? And what are you guys doing? In Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, it says, David asked the soldiers nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Now, I want you to get this. you got a boy on one hand asking these questions, and you have a king and an army that every time this guy would come out, they would hide. And this is, this, listen, this sounds really good in church. This sounds really good in retrospect. But I, I don't know if I would want to step up and fight a nine-foot giant with a 15-pound tip spear and a sword that was super big and heavy who dared to just stand and challenge an army full of men and said, come and get me. This is accurate, but it's also symbolic, right? When we see things that are big, we can begin to feel very small. Does this make sense? So we're talking about assumptions. I guess David was young enough that he didn't even know he was that small. Young enough to not know any better. He was idealist, right? He he just couldn't stand. I don't know why this guy, he wasn't really angry at these guys for being weak. He was actually angry because this guy was defying the armies of Israel. So, 1 Samuel 17, 32, it comes down to this. He says, don't worry, he's talking to the king now because when he began to ask all these questions, the word made it back to King Saul and he said, bring this kid before me. And he says, look, don't worry about this Philistine. David told Saul, I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul said. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. So you look at this and you say, okay, uh, okay, I know y'all, you know, you probably don't bet. But if you did bet, and you were going to bet on this fight, you'd have probably had a really hard time putting your money on David, a boy against a giant, a man of war since his youth. And so Saul's not crazy, is he? And this is where I want our perspective to shift a little bit. It's easy to go, yes, yeah, Saul, was, Saul wasn't understanding that he was king of Israel and the power of God and all these things. As much as he was just looking with these very natural eyes and going, this is not going to work. What did he say? (laughs) Don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. This, uh, This isn't a judgment on Saul. And it's not a judgment about David. As much as I want you to kind of find yourself in this situation and think about, How would you have seen this situation? Statistically, we would all be part of the army. We would all see that this challenge was too big. We would be afraid. We would uh, would look to the right and see our friend was afraid. We would look to the left and see our friend was afraid. We would look to the king and see that he was afraid. And we would go, I should probably be afraid. Anybody with me? I'd love to think I'd be David, but I don't think I would be. I would probably read the room, read the field in that case. I would look at the camp and I would go, this is bad. We should hide. Really quiet in here. The reason I say that is because we can't ever assume that we're going to see things the way people like David saw things. We can't always assume that we're going to see things the way that Jesus saw things. Unless we align our vision, unless we align our perspective and we line our hearts up with God's word. Unless we're in tune with that guiding voice of the Holy Spirit that he says he would empower you with and empower me with. It's then that we can begin to see things the right way so that we can react the right way. I mean, I'd love to be 
minded like David. I just don't know if I would. But because of the way he saw things, and I want you to just kind of see this too. In 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 48, it said, it said, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Quickly ran out to meet him. David saw how he wanted this thing to go down. He didn't wait. He didn't, oh boy, here goes. You know what I noticed is not in here? It didn't say David prayed. This isn't me knocking prayer. It just did say he didn't, he didn't do anything ritualistic. He quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into, it, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone, the stone sank in. Uh, and I'm sorry, I would just say this. Like In between here, you should read this because there's a lot of junk talking going on between David and Goliath. It's just definitely worth reading. Sorry. Uh, and the stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone uh, because he had no sword. Now he did, uh, he did borrow Goliath's sword to kill him and cut his head off. And then David became ultimately the David we knew. But my point being that we are prone, and we are, frankly, I believe, can't establish this in Scripture. I believe that we live in an era where we're being programmed to be more like the army than we are to be more like David. We're being told what to think, told how to act, told what to do, told where to stand, told what to... You just name it. You're being told. You're being, it's being dictated to you and I exactly how and where and when and whatever we should do, act, stand, uh, proclaim, do whatever, all that stuff. And it is, it is imperative that we understand as believers that that direction for all of those things should only come from God himself to you and I. Because if we're going to stand and we're not going to make the mistakes that the Israelite army made, if we're going to stand and we're not going to find ourselves sleeping in caves and cowering from threats, we need to understand that to God, no mountain is too big. But to us, we, can, we, we seem to be able to just make mountains out of anything. Any of you got the gift of pessimism? You know what the gift of pessimism looks like, right? It's like on the most beautiful, clear, sunny day, all you see is the opportunity for clouds to move in. You look up and say, oh boy, it's a lot of space for clouds. And a lot of us are like that. We just, we look, oh yeah, boy. This won't last long. Surely there's trouble to come. And it's okay, there is trouble to come. But God's with you in the trouble. He's with you in the, in, the, in the storm. He's with you in the clear days. And that he's able to do the opposite of what we do. He's actually able to level the ground. And Zechariah, amazing, amazing stuff here. Uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, I'm just starting out, right? Uh, there's some conversation going on again, I encourage you to go to this. Like You can pick these verses up, dive in, pick up where we're at. He said, don't you know? The angel of the Lord asked, this is a conversation between Zechariah and an angel. No, my Lord, I replied. Uh, and he said this. He said, then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was building a temple. He said, it's not by force, nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's army. Many of you know that verse is not by power, not by might, but by my spirit. Just a different way of translating it. Nothing. Now, this is, this is what I said. When you stand where God's standing, this is kind of the truth that embodies that to a degree, right? Nothing. Not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become level. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it. May God bless it. So you see, and this is just a, I'm just grabbing this out of there. There's not a lot of context in that, but I want you to see the premise, right? Zerubbabel was doing what God had instructed him to do. So it wasn't that this, this was Zerubbabel's idea, some he had, in, you know, just something, some way. He was doing what the Lord had told him to do. And it says this, that when you and I come alongside of what God is doing, when we get in his 
in his stream, in his flow, and we're doing the things that he wants us to do, then he has this amazing ability to take mountains in front of you and level them into like a, a, a desert plain or, or, or just a plain, a flat space, so that there's not as much effort, there's not as much energy, there's not as much uh, anything required to accomplish that which God has for you to accomplish. So we see how God is when we're beside him, when we're working along with him. We see what happens when we, when we shift and we start looking at things through our own eyes. So how, does it, how is it practical for you and I? I want you to think about this. I want you to think, because usually it's, it's, you don't even have to dig far. You know what your big thing is. You know what the thing that, that, that when, you, when somebody says, if I could, if I could uh, you know, uh, come along and I could wave my hand and, and make your biggest problem go away, it doesn't take you long to figure out what that biggest problem is. And if it does take you a long time, thank the Lord, right? Good for you. It's awesome. But you know what that is, and here's what I would say. You see it, and you've looked at it, and you think you know what it is. What I think the Lord would say to you is, is get, get into his perspective and look at your problem. Take that problem and don't ignore it. Don't run from it. Don't discard it. Don't think it's just going to go away. You know, what we say is, you know, uh, you, if you haul anything into the light, it's going to be dealt with. Does that make sense? But a lot of times our biggest problems, we try to keep them hidden away in dark places in our mind, in our heart, in our life. We just, no, 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 it's not a thing, it's not a thing. Haul that thing out there, right? Bring it out into the light. Look at what it is and ask God to give you his perspective on that. Ask God to give you his solution on that. Ask God to show you how you should approach that. You see, I think the difference between David and the rest of every person in that army is David was looking at Goliath from God's perspective. I'll say it again. David was looking at Goliath from God's perspective, not from his own. And you and I tend to do the same thing. I'll look at it from my perspective, and then I'll ask my friends, who, guess what? My friends are usually like a lot like me, frankly. And I say, what do you think about it? Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, that's what I thought. Can I whine to you about how terrible it is? Yes. Whine away. We leave. No solution, right? We don't realize that, look, doesn't mean that we don't have significant issues. Doesn't mean that we don't have real mountains in our life. But God is either able to level the mountain or be with you in the mountain, right? And guide you all along the way. Actually, mountains are where you are made strong. If everything was easy... You'd never grow. I'd never grow. So don't despise the mountain, but look, there's going to be enough mountains on its own. You don't have to make any where there aren't any. And the way that you make small things, big things, is to look right through these and listen right through these and not first put these. I give my eyes to the Lord, my ears to the Lord my mind to the Lord, my assumptions to the Lord. I, I was having a conversation with a, another pastor this week, and it's funny because he has a different position than I do about a certain issue. And it's funny the lengths that I had to go to to say, look, I'm not, I don't want to argue about this. I want to know how would you get there. Because at the end of the day, and this is my heart, at the end of the day, if you know something is scriptural that I don't know, I need to get there. I'm willing to move. I'm not assuming that I'm right. I might have been taught by a crazy person about that thing. And they gave me a totally wrong stance. And I just bought it hook, line, sinker, and I've lived my life that way, and it's never been an issue. And I ran into this guy, and he lives it different. And I thought, man, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm not biblical on that issue? And I thought that that has become, for me personally, that has become the place that I spend more time than anything. That I want to live according to God's word. I don't care what the cost. I don't care if it means me saying I'm wrong 50 times a day. I don't mind. It doesn't mean that I question everything that I know is true about the scripture. You're not going to tell me Jesus isn't the son of God. You're not going to tell me that he didn't 
uh, he wasn't crucified. You're not going to tell me he wasn't resurrected. You're not going to tell me all that. Like this, the essentials, I got that. But it's these kind of fringe things that everybody likes to kind of occupy our time with that we have to understand that I want to see those things biblically, but not only that, I want to see everything as God sees it. Because then I'm going to be more like David, less like Saul, right? And, I'm, and I might not have to hike for 40 days and 40 nights for God to tell me to go back again. That's kind of how it works. And so if you're one of those people, you just got a lot of mountains, take them on one by one. Ask the Lord to show you, are they really mountains? Are they really big things? Or are they just kind of a small thing? Is it something that He even wants you to deal with? Maybe you're facing a mountain that's not your mountain. Maybe God's made a way for you to go around that thing. I don't know. You have to ask the Holy Spirit. But I guess my point is, in all this, is that I see a lot of believers a lot of times overwhelmed with issues that are huge. And, and, and I just wonder sometimes, are those yours? To, or should you even be there? The same question that God asked Elijah. Elijah. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? So I pray the Lord gives you some insight into wherever you are. Uh, I didn't get into a lot of very specific things because guess what? The Holy Spirit has His job. His job is to deal with you right where you are. His promise is to help you right where you are. And all you have to do is say, you know, Lord, I want to see things the way you see things. Lord, I want to be, I want to have that perspective. Amen? Amen. All right. Can we stand? I want to pray for you guys. Listen, the number one thing uh, that, is con- that I would say, that the most important thing that's contrary to everything I just said is a lot of times we make the issue of how we deal with Jesus, we make that a small thing when it's actually the biggest thing that we've ever faced. So if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. If you're here this morning and you've never asked God, asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to forgive you of your sin, to give you eternal life and forgiveness, then that needs to be the biggest mountain in your life. That needs to be the one thing that you're focused on. Why? Because it's by that decision that every other decision can be made right. He's the one person that can restore everything to its right order. So if you haven't done that and you'd like to, I want to invite you uh, right after I pray, just Join us at the back corner back here. Uh, There's folks there that want to pray with you, folks there that want to answer any questions that you might have. Before anything, we have to know Jesus as our Savior. And we have to understand that the beginning wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And if we don't know that, we're probably going to get everything else mostly wrong. How about that? Lord, I just thank you, God, for your people. I thank you, Father, for their hearts to worship you, God, to know you, to hear your word. God, I pray that as each and every person goes from this place, God, that they'll go and that they'll bear your name everywhere they go, that they'll desire to see things from your perspective and not their own. God, that they'll live their lives in alignment with your word. Lord, that you would not just bless them, but bless everybody that they come into contact with because they know you. So Lord, I pray that every business, every household, every store, every school, everywhere that your people set foot, God, I pray they bring your kingdom with them. Let them sing your praises everywhere they go so that someone might know you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll Empower them to do that. That we'll be good ambassadors of the name of Jesus Christ. And I ask that you do all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. It was awesome being with you. We'll see you next week or Saturday even.